This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicki Fraser. Hello, and welcome to the 1000 Authors Show. Today, I am here with Jocelyn Brady, brain coach, uh, wise owl, and all-round very funny lady. And we are going to be talking about why our brains are such magical assholes. And this is something that I am obviously super interested in because I have a brain. I do. And it is constantly amazing me. It's amazing me with the things that it is incredible at. It's amazing me with the things that it's really terrible at. And it amazes me with its ability to just just totally bullshit me about everything all the time. The stories that we tell ourselves and the issues that we cause ourselves. And so I thought, right, we're going to sit down with somebody who actually understands this stuff. So Jocelyn is going to come and talk to us about all manner of things, including how our brains lie to us, what we can do about it, a few things that we can do to improve ourselves, why we need to do the things we want to do before we die. And all the power of funny, the power of funny. We're going to talk about that as well. So I hope you enjoy this episode with me and Jocelyn. I hope you enjoy actually experiencing in real time the fallibility of our brains. And yeah, so without further ado, let's get started. Jocelyn Brady, welcome to the 1000 Authors Show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Could you? I'm I'm going to like ask the standard questions. Like, could you tell us a bit about yourself, um, et cetera, et cetera. But before you do that, um, I want to direct everybody to watch your tiny tips for your brain because they are freaking hilarious. Um, and they inspired me to make the sum total of two videos, which I am going to pick that up again at some point. Um, but yeah, the tiny tips for your brain are just, they're absolute genius. They're so funny. So everybody needs to go and watch those. And I, would, I will, we'll talk about those in a little bit. But before we do, what do you do? You're a brain coach. Tell us what that is. Yeah. So it's brain coaching is essentially helping people's brains think better. So it's bringing to the surface some some thoughts that are getting in the way of you doing what you most want to be doing and creating and experiencing and then learning how to flip the script on those and take them in a new direction. So you're telling yourself fewer lies about not being good enough or you know, the imposter syndrome stuff. You don't know how to do something. You'll never know how to do something. Everything's going to hell and like flipping the script on all that. Cool. Cause that is like, that's my standard daily script in my head. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to that will be like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds like my brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And especially for, for entrepreneur, probably particularly women entrepreneurs, um, but entrepreneurs and leaders um, who just, who have a lot of people looking up to them. And it's like, unless you're a sociopath, you're probably having some kind of worries and some kind of old habitual thinking that that might not be helpful. Yeah. And it's really actually um, in a kind of schadenfreude way, really reassuring to know that people who look like they have their shit together actually have a shit storm going on in their heads. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can never tell what's going on in someone else's brain by looking at someone, let alone you hardly even know what's going on in your own brain. So I know, right? Because what's going on in my head most of the time is, huh, how do hoverflies hover like that? Yeah. <laughs> is my but why is the sky blue? Really? What? Yeah. And is green, is green the same to everyone else as it is to me? And do and we then... even see our colors real? <laughs> yeah. Purple is not, but that's a topic for a different day. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. about, so this, this episode is titled, and we literally just came up with this before I pressed record, but this episode is titled, um, why our brains are magical asshats. And I actually had to, <laughs> I had to look at that again. So <laughs> my brains and asshat, tell us in what ways our brains are magical asshats and what lies that they tell us. Yeah. I mean, they're, I, I like to think of they're, they're magical because they literally keep us alive. Um, they're keeping everything within our, our organism alive and that's their primary job. But then on top of that, they think thoughts and tell stories and communicate nebulous masses of information that's sitting in, in a locked uh, cage in our skulls into somebody else's. So that to me is part of the, the greatest magic that exists, you know, being able to express and communicate an idea from one brain to another or too many. Um, but they also are full of lies because their number one job is to keep us safe. They tell all kinds of lies about why you shouldn't do something new, why you should stay in your comfort zone. You know, and that, that gets in the way all the time, <clears throat> as we know, when we're trying to 
explore something new, try a new career, make new breakthroughs in our existing career, um, wanting to do something we've never done before, wanting to write a book or another book. Um, even if you've done it before, your brain can still be a little asshat about it. Um, yeah, because it's just like, what is the path to least resistance to keeping you alive? Brain's like, let's do that. Let's not do all the other work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and okay then. So can you tell me why um why I why my brain is trying to stop me from going to my first ever Muay Thai class? Ooh, well, <laughs> brain is worried that uh you're you're going to destroy it. <laughs> um I mean actually it's kind of it's kind of why your your brain tells you it's like, well, this has never been done before. We don't know what this looks like. And so we're going to create all of the alerts that tell you why it's a bad idea. And, and that the very extreme is death, which is highly unlikely, but still you have like that fear that, Oh, I don't know. It's a, uh, it, I haven't, I am not able to play the script in my head of something that's occurred before. So, and brain isn't very good at projecting the future because it does that using the past. It's the only thing it knows how to do. So that's one of the reasons. And maybe you've watched too many bad Muay Thai fights and it's like, I'm definitely going to be kicked in the head and bloodied within my first 15 minutes of class because that's how it works. Yeah, I'm going to fall on my face. That is pretty much given. Um, I'm kind of used to that. So I guess that can be applied to doing anything new, like whether that's Muay Thai class or whether it's writing a book or whether it's doing a skydive or even just walking into a room full of people that you have never met before. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what what was public speaking, I think, is number one on the fears above death and spiders. Yeah. So it's like jumping out of a plane covered in spiders uh, into a big audience. <laughs> then you kind of have the fear of all at once. Um, what was the question? I got distracted by my brain. <laughs> Um, you pretty much answered it. And I had another question and I got distracted by my brain. So this episode is going to be both of us going, what were we going to say? Brain? <laughs> what? Okay. So, oh, I remember what it was now. So does this, does this get better as you get, does this get worse as you get older? Do you think? Um, that's a good question. I think, you know, part of the reason I got into this, all of brain science in the first place was when my dad had a stroke in my um, early twenties and he was 59. And uh, he lost his ability to speak um, temporarily. He got it back, but it, but it obviously freaked me out. Um, and that's when I learned as much, started learning as much as I could about what was going on. So the Broca area of his, Broca's area of his brain was damaged. And that's like how you can think thoughts and translate them into words. Um, and he was able to regenerate that. So it was like, wow, you even a physically damaged older brain can literally rewire and repair. So what's possible to our, you know, people who haven't been through severe trauma, um, physical trauma. I think probably most of us has, have experienced some kind of life trauma and emotional traumas. Um, I think though that the more we practice um, flexibility in thought, the easier that that can get, or at least the more habitual it can get. Cause I don't know that it's necessarily easy to, to, uh, you know, kind of stepping outside of the comfort zone of what your, your evolution has said, no, 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 no safety first. Um, but yet we also need novelty and crave it, um, to keep our brains healthy. So long way I think of, of answering your question no it was a really interesting way because I was going to ask you how you got into this um how, how you're interested in it and that makes makes perfect sense that you know you would do that after somebody that you love has suffered um a brain injury and you know you're you're right it is fascinating and so what can we do so would you would you think would you say that um it's important to challenge the ideas that you think you have and to you know to find people who disagree with you to find different points of view is that all part of keeping your brain healthy and 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 working and growing yeah it's a great question i think so i think i mean diversity of everything in in life is keeps it interesting keeps um ecosystems and habitats healthy and i think the same of diversity of thought and belief system um and 
And look at what's happening. I mean, especially in America, so divisive, right? And we kind of, it's like you have to pick on this binary and we know how much trouble thinking in binary terms gets us. It's like, it's either this or this or nothing. And that's <laughs> bullshit. And so the more I think we can listen to different ideas and entertain other ideas in our own brains, we don't have to commit to them. We don't have to date them or marry them, <laughs> but just like, let them come in and play and see how they feel, try them on um, and be less, uh, you know, reactive and judgmental. Cause I think we can, you know, part of that tendency of safety first is otherizing and trying to get rid of ideas and beliefs that feel threatening to everything that we've known, which can make us brittle if we, uh, we stick to that way of thinking and being. Yeah, there was, there's a famous quote, isn't there? That the sign of the sign of um, an intelligent mind is the ability to entertain an idea with or entertain two opposing ideas without accepting either of them. Is I've, I've just mangled that quote, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna quote that. I'm like, who said that? Was it like Socrates or Confucius or something? I have no idea. Okay, I don't wait, know. Vicky, Vicky said it. <laughs> I, I mangled it. I will take credit for mangling it. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, then let's talk a little bit about um, let's talk a little bit about some of the ways in which our brains will lie to us and how that scuppers us and what we can do to counteract it. Yeah, I mean, some of the most common things I see, particularly again with entrepreneurs, is the inability, the anxiety that comes up with quiet times. So when you're not busy doing the work, when you're doing the work, it's usually fine, right? We, when we're doing the thing that we love, um, we can get lost in flow and all of the illusions of we're not able to do something and those, the, the BS stories we're telling can, can just melt away because we're, we're busy doing the thing. But it's the quiet time around doing the thing where brain can go like, well, you're never going to get another contract or you're not making enough money or yeah, okay, but you, you made a big check this time, but when's the next one coming? Um, and they're not always like financial. That's a big one, I think, with a lot of entrepreneurs stepping out into entrepreneurship for the first time, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about embracing uncertainty. And we don't have a lot of practice doing that in, in our lives and our upbringing, for the most part. Um, westernized school <clears throat> is not conducive to creating the most creative, resilient, adaptive brains. It's more about training us to report in and out at a certain time. It's making us great at manufacturing jobs that no longer exist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so it's no wonder we have a bunch of lies reinforced that our brain is telling us as, as we're growing older and as we're trying new things. And especially if we've been in a career for a certain amount of time and stepping into a new one, it's going like, no, that's insane. That's not how we do things. That's not how society do things. Look around you. You know, nine out of 10 people are employed by somebody else. Um, so you're in, you're the insane one. Um, those, that's like a start of some of the lies, you know, uh, everyone's going to laugh at me, the public speaking. There's a lot of, um, uh, anxiety as we talked about coming, coming with leaders who need to step in front of their teams or other audiences and their brain's just like, I don't, I can't do this. I've never done this. Uh, I have nothing good to say. Ugh. Um, and my mind used to do that. She used to be extremely anxious with public speaking. Um, and it was just, yeah, a bunch of BS. So how do you, how do you help people overcome that then? Like what's, for, for example, one of my biggest issues, I'm like, I'm going to get you to help me for free now on the podcast. I'm kidding. Um, but like one of my biggest issues is like, oh, what if I'm wrong in front of people? And like the logical part of my brain knows that that's fine. Nobody expects everybody to, to know everything and be right all the time. But then there's another bit that's like, oh, but if I've got clients and I've got people who are listening to me and I've got people who are learning from me, I have to be right like all of the time. So mm. how do, how, what's a good way to kind of deal with that level of bullshit? You know, one of the things I like to ask with questions like that is what's the worst possible thing that could happen and what's the worst possible thing that could be true and you just keep digging you just keep digging and digging like if i'm wrong that means what um yeah i might say something for me uh i didn't study enough um i'm not smart enough uh i don't have i can't remember enough things to communicate um the mil millions of bits of information completely accurately <laughs> when called to it 
um, just kind of exploring those, like, what are the, all of the things coming up? Because your brain's created a narrative around this, that, that being wrong, quote unquote, means something very bad. That means something about your identity and who you are at your core. And, you know, people talk about limiting beliefs. You want to call it that, that could be a helpful way of looking at it where it's like, what is that ultimately saying about you? And once you hit on that trigger, you found something like if it, if it's, it means, I, I am no, of no value, for example. Um, it's like, oof, then you kind of get to the root of the script. You can then flip and then you prove yourself wrong. Here's all the reasons, which is meta here. Uh, here's all the reasons this belief is wrong. And here's all the reasons I've, I've shown up in a way where, uh, you know, proving brain is inaccurate is we have tons of inaccuracies and, you know, cognitive distortions or fallacies uh, that are going on. And it's really just spending the time going, okay, let's kind of just sit with this, break it apart, and let's explore all the ways this is not right. And what do I actually want to be thinking? You know, got to create a new habit and groove of thought. That existing one that you have will never go away. It's like the Grand Canyon but you can create a new one for the stream to flow down. Okay. I love that idea. I love that. And we're back again to habits and stories, aren't we? The, the habits that our brains get into and the stories that we tell ourselves. And that's an incredibly powerful thing. And I think that pe- people think about storytelling as, as being this thing that we do for other people and that we can put out there. And obviously that's what I'm in the business of doing. And it, you're kind of in the business of the stories that we tell ourselves and how they become true. So can you talk a little bit more about that and how the, how powerful the stories we tell ourselves are and, and why it's so important to know what's going on in there? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Some of, some of the stories we tell ourselves are, are like invisible to us. We don't even realize they're there. And I think that to me is one of the most important things, kind of bringing them to awareness. Or if you'd like an acronym, ACT, A-C-T, very simple, and a meta in itself. Awareness, choosing a new direction, and uh, taking action. And that's basically it, just bringing these things to the surface, choosing a new route, and deliberately making the habit practice of thinking those new thoughts, of proving yourself inaccurate on the, on the ones that are driving you nuts. What we tell ourselves shapes how we show up in the world, who we think we are, what we think we're capable of. Um, and, and we usually are cruelest to ourselves we say things to ourselves we would never tell someone we love or you know we wouldn't tell a friend in need or or a child the kinds of things that we tell ourselves yeah you know it and it's uh releasing even the judgment on that and going like okay wow that's not a helpful thought if you just look at these things as helpful or not helpful that can be helpful um (laughs) Just to see like what are the the stories I'm telling myself that can make me bitter, resentful, closed down, angry, because I'm not being true to something I really want. And that's a lot of the protective me- mechanism coming in and your brain's coming in and saying like, here's why these other things are a bad idea. So let's create all these narratives around it. And those ultimately, you know, make you closed off to your your greatest potential and joy I love that so it sounds to me like because quite often you you kind of hear people say something like oh that's just the way he is or that's just who he is and you know they'll never change and I've always had a suspicion that that's bullshit is it bullshit people can change right oh my god yeah I was just watching oh we're not gonna do it justice it was yesterday I was just soaking up a bunch of working on my next tiny tip um which will be probably thinking about deathbed you. It's fun. It's fun time. It's birthday week. Um, But I was watching this guy talk about how much we, how do you say, we uh, we're very bad at predicting how much we'll change in the future. um, Massively under, like under, under guess how much we'll change. And we think that in the next 10 years, we'll be pretty similar. Like we'll have similar tastes. We'll have similar relationship, um, career, where we, where, where we live, what we do, who we're with, what we're like, our personalities, our preferences. We think that those things are going to be pretty constant and we are 
totally not. Right. We can't predict stuff. We're really bad at it. And this guy says we change. I think it was something like even one in a 53 year old life, one year can you can change much more than you might in a decade from your 30s or it's just things that we I'm like, wow, because I sometimes think about uh, older people like my bias might be well, you either get old and then you're just stuck in your ways and you don't really, you just walk to the mailbox and then how can you possibly change? So it's it's just helpful to hear these scientists who look at this go like, we really have no idea. Like, you know, we're doing our best. We're making stuff up as we go based on the past and we really don't know what's going to happen. And yeah, we can, we have the potential to change so much. It sounds like, that sounds kind of like that analogy where they say that generals are always fighting the last war and so that's all they have to base something on and it's like well that doesn't really you know you can draw some experience some knowledge from your experience but it doesn't really tell you what's going to happen in the future and it's not always that useful sounds like brains are kind of the same yeah exactly and it's uh that tendency right to want to go into the previous pattern what the known um but uh, what did didn't America surprise the the British Army or something? I don't know history very well. Okay, I only am American by I wasn't born here even. Anyway, um, <laughs> we, well, I was born I was born in Canada. I mean, I'm by I'm dual dual citizen. Um, but yeah, I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and then raised in Hawaii. So how far away can you get? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but it's just you know kind of. I think that's going back to what you asked earlier, it's like practicing these skills, you get better at it, right? As you go and practicing things like play. I think that's like one of my number one jams is how do you get people to play more? Because that's when we're testing our skills and figuring stuff out in a really healthy, joyful, non-judgmental way that can realize, show us that we have these skills and capabilities that we may have another uh, not seen otherwise. That's why I'm also a big advocate of improv. That really helped me get out of my head um, and feel more comfortable not knowing what to say uh, next because that was one of my biggest fears. So you've Looking done like an idiot. Yeah, I did it for four years. I signed up for <laughs> yeah, I signed up for a uh, one night. So I don't know. I've I've told some people this story, but I was getting so sick. I kind of literal hemorrhoids from having to show up and speak in front of clients it was early in my business. And I'm like, this is not <laughs> cool. So I thought, well, I'm getting, I'm getting sick. My hair's falling out. I'm so nervous. Like this is, this is killing me. And you know, I was like in my twenties, like, come on. So I was like, what's the scariest thing I can imagine? Uh, standing in front of a bunch of people, not knowing what to say and possibly looking like an idiot um, and having to be myself. Oh God. So I signed up for improv, which you get to be a character too. Um, yeah. And I thought I'll do it. I'll do this one night and I'll see how it goes. And Oh my God, I had to drag myself there. It was like, dun, 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 dun. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Driving all the way parking. Like you can, you could turn around now. You could just go, you could just turn around and then walking up, you know, to, to, to the building, opening the door, and then like up until, you know, it slams behind me. I'm, I'm thinking I can just run away. I can just leave. Um, and then it, about 10 minutes in, I forgot all of that. It all melted away. And I, and the time flew by and I was like, wait, how do I, I need more of this in my life? And I wound up doing it for four years. That led me into hosting a stand-up comedy and storytelling show. And um, it gave me way more confidence in doing workshop facilitation, which I fell in love with. I like, that's one of my favorite things is facilitating workshops, emceeing, hosting, um, on top of doing the one-on-one -on -one work. That sounds so cool. I've been looking for an improv um, class slash workshop, something for ages, and you have just inspired me to go and carry on looking for that. Now that kind of we're coming out of lockdown and everything, I feel like I can I can go and do a bit more of that because I do, I, I actually, I'm probably one of the very few people in the world who enjoys speaking in front of an audience, um, much better in front of an audience than I am one-on-one. -on -one. Um, oh which is interesting uh, but yeah it sounds like it sounds like that improv thing is is similar I I think that's partly why I do trapeze and for me that's a similar thing it's like I get to be somebody else and I get to go and perform and I have the same feeling before I go out on stage I'm like I could just go like I could I could yeah. go. 
nobody will die if I go and that will be better and um I I still get that like every single time and I like you say it just disappears after a while um so do you think that is like legit a good piece of advice to tell somebody to go and do something creative like that that puts you in front of people and takes you out of that comfort zone and 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 that will then allow them to do the thing that they're scared of doing. So for me, my focus is always on writing and writing books. And, you know, one of the big things that people say is that I'm terrified. What if, what if it's shit? What if everybody hates it? What if nobody wants to read it? Um, all of which are exactly the same um, fears that you had with improv, I'm sure, and that I have with trapeze and with writing generally. So do you, is that something that you would advise people to go and do? Just like go do something horrifying. A thousand million percent. Yeah. Um, yeah, sign up for any, and it, you can take a baby step too, because it's just be like, maybe you've never tried dance before you sign up for a dance class or pottery. I do think with, with writing, it could be really helpful to sign up for a stand up comedy class. Um, you'll be in the same boat with everybody. It sounds terrifying, but you're learning how to construct a joke and, um, I promise you, you'll have a good time. And it is terrifying at first. And then you'll be like, if I can do this, I can write anything. (laughs) It just, it's very empowering. Um, Or any kind of like storytelling, poetry, any kind of class where you, part of the assignment is sharing it with other people. Um, And then you'll see that it's not, it's never the worst. It's never as bad as you think. And, um, And even if everybody hates it and thinks you're an idiot, like it's extremely unlikely that'll ever happen but so what what do we why is that such a terrible thing with our you know well if it's because you read something they didn't like it's like what you say you know the the um that quote um the ones who matter won't mind and the ones who mind won't ma- don't matter yeah. and it's exactly that it's like if somebody in here doesn't like a uh, story or something i have to say that i really care about and i put time into i might be wrong but i you know, care about it, then so what? They're not my people, you know, or, or maybe it'll force uh, or open up a new dialogue um, that makes us both see something new and different. Um, yeah. yeah. It's funny that that's one of our biggest fears, like looking stupid and people thinking we're, we're idiots when it's like, yeah. is that really so bad? You know? And yeah, you're, you're right. And that's just reminded me as well. It's like that really important, it's really important to separate yourself from the work you do as well, because just because some, and I think we forget that, right? It's like, okay, they might not find me funny or they might not like what I've put out there, but that doesn't mean they don't like me as a person. It doesn't diminish my worth as a person anymore. Is, is that something that you find, do, do people conflate their work with who they are a lot? Yeah, I mean, identity is such a juicy topic in of itself, right? And I think a lot of us get wrapped up in in what we do. And then we're also, we are guessing so much of the time. We're like judging by someone's reaction, like they they squinched their eyebrows, therefore they think I'm an idiot. It's like, you have no idea. You have no idea what that person is. Like. Maybe they're thinking about how someone cut them off earlier in traffic that day or how their daughter is really sick and they're afraid to tell someone about it. You just have no clue. And we are very, um, one of the things our brain is very good at is being self-referential. So it's looking around and it's like, yeah, but what about me? Here's how I relate to this. Um, and it's like, and to be aware of that too, it's like your brain is caught, it's just making up stories to make itself feel good, um, relevant, valuable to give you cues and information. And a lot of it is false. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I don't know if I actually came around to answer that completely no you did um and it was I mean it was it was just like a a chat about an important topic and I liked it because you're right identity is far too big a topic to dive into properly now so we're not going to um but we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll come back and talk about it another time because I want to swerve wildly back to comedy again because that's something that you mentioned did I see you mention it on Instagram why comedy is so important uh, yes, I'm going to be on a on a workshop panel with two other ladies um, in late July. Details to come. Lovely. Um, really excited about that. And it's just all of us are people who use comedy. Comedy and humor is very important to our work. So not necessarily comedians, but you know, we've all. I think all of us have done improv or studied comedy to some to some extent. <clears throat> um, absolutely. If we're not laughing, if you're not laughing daily, what? So, like life sucks, you know, like if, if you're not finding some kind of joy um, and laughter 
And it's like physical, it's, it's good for us. It's good for our body. It's bonding. It's like, try to go listen to a baby giggling and not experience glee. Yeah. If you don't find joy in hilarious laughter, people around you laughing, who you care about watching something, you know, it's, there's probably something actually to be addressed. Um, if you can't experience joy, there is a very rare disorder where people cannot experience pleasure and joy. But then, you know, there's also like depressive symptoms. But I do find that it's like so many hard things happen. Life is just a strange thing. We have no idea how long we're going to be here. We, we tend to imagine, we kind of like avoid thinking about our deaths and how long we're going to live and how healthy we're going to be for that longevity. It, and then it becomes real when we start to see people around us, like our parents falling ill um, or people around us dying. But we still sort of have a denial about our own mortality. And uh, that to me is also kind of hilarious. <laughs> so it's like, what are we going to do? Are you going to like laugh or sit around and be miserable for most of the time? There's going to be painful things that happen. There's going to be all kinds of uncertainty constantly. Um, so find something to to laugh about. Find people who you can laugh with. I like that advice. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's perfect advice. And it's a neat segue into um, doing the things that we want to do before we die. Let's talk about that for a couple of minutes. Yeah, that's, that's something that's what super, super, super drives me. What's important to me is when I hear people talk about something that's really important to them and they keep having the, their brain is telling them lies, right? Like you can't do this. It's impractical. You have no idea who are you to even try that kind of really unkind stuff people are telling themselves. And I'm just like, man, you got one life far as we know. We don't know how long. Please do the thing that you most want to do before you die. Please, please, please. You only got one chance, right? Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to give it a shot. And then once you're on your deathbed, it's like the thing, the things people say on their deathbed they regret most is not being true, is essentially not being true to yourself. <laughs> so not following through on something that's really important to you and not being honest and clear in your communication with the people that you love. So figure out a tiny step you can take towards that big thing that's important to you. It can be the most ridiculously laughable, uh, small thing. Like it's in the case of writing a book, right? It's like, can you go write one sentence? Mm -hmm. One word. Try writing one. You just have to write down a word. That's your first assignment. And then you do that and you celebrate. And then you do it again and you celebrate and you create that you know, neural dopamine, like the happy brain chemicals that show, that prove to yourself you're following through, that it feels good to follow through. And it does literally just take one tiny step at a time. Over time, it's going to add up. Yeah, that's, that's such good advice. And I think related to that as well, um, is something that really frustrates me because I'm like, I moonlight as a trapeze teacher and a pole dancing teacher as well. And one of the things that I don't know, it just drives me around the bend is when I will be talking to, oh, I wish I could do that. Well, why don't you? And oh, because I'm too old. And that's the thing. Oh, <sighs> because I'm too old to try something new. And it's just like, no, no, you're not. It's never too late to try anything new. And like I saw somebody this morning in a, in a workshop that I'm a part of. I was like, oh, you know, I need to, I need to do this. I need to do this thing before it's too late. And it's like, when is it going to be? It's only too late when you're dead. You know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, I just oh, we're, we're going to have to talk about more of this um, in, in the future because we are, we are running out of time now, which sucks um, because I have a couple more things that I want to ask you. Um, but this is this has been awesome. So before we finish and before we wrap up, um, I always ask everybody what they're reading at the moment. So what are you reading at the moment, please, Jocelyn? Yeah, I just picked up again the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. It is. Uh, highly recommend to everybody. It's so good. Um, and it's been long enough that I don't remember all of it. <laughs> so I think it's a good time to pick it up again. And I find it a good inspiration for kind of some of my writing style where you don't have to think about your own book as being this 
strictly cohesive through line narrative. It could just be kind of how you approach your life or life philosophy. Yeah. Which is, uh, by the way, a perfect way to start writing a book, whether it ends up that way or not. It's like, just get your dumb thoughts out of your head and onto a piece of paper one word at a time, like you said. Yeah. Way. Um, okay. So what are you writing at the moment? Uh, you know, this might be an excuse, but I do feel like the tiny tips have been an exercise in, in me writing, really creating something for myself for the first time ever. So, you know, I used to work in branding, helping these really big companies um, shape their brands and tell their stories and training their teams how to do that. And I completely neglected making my own stuff. Like the last time I really wrote was in my MFA program, like 2013, I think is when I finished 2012, something like that. Um, so part of it is tying tips. And I do put so much time into making these. So I have a lot of information that isn't necessarily completely organized or anything after, but I feel like those are also leading somewhere because it's what I love talking about and obsessively research and maybe they come together in their own kind of fashion. I really hope they are going to lead somewhere because not just because like they are a genuine delight to watch and every single one of them um, doesn't just make me think and change my mind and make me feel something. It's also pretty fucking funny. Um, you are, and it totally makes sense because I was like, oh, how is she this funny? And it's like, oh, you've actually done comedy. So that that explains it. And that actually, that was, again, a lovely thing to learn because I was like, oh, I don't have to go and make videos and just be instantly that funny because that's just not going to happen because I have not practiced it, whereas you have. Um, so thank you for letting us know that. That, made, that makes me <laughs> um, But could you also just answer very quickly, how long does it take you to put these videos together? Uh, it can range. The very first one I did in one sitting. Never been able to do that again. That was... Um, but it was like maybe three hours or something because I just had an idea and I filmed it and I didn't know what I, I, you know, I've been teaching myself how to edit this whole time. Yeah. Now um, it's a few days of research and then I could film and edit in one day, but that's an extremely long day. So I try to stretch it out over a couple of days. Okay. That is also good to know. Cause um, I think there's probably a lot of people out there like me who watch videos like that and are like, I'm just going to do this. And then it's a lot more work than you think it's going to be. And then you're like, I'm not going to do that. It's, it's too much. So it's good to <laughs> kind of have a guide as to how long you think it's, it's going to take. But yeah, so where can people find, where can people find your tiny tips? Tiny tips on YouTube and Instagram. Um, find me on YouTube at jostle them. You can find me in both places, but I would like to build my YouTube, um, you know, community. Um, yep. And then obviously jostle them Instagram. You can hit me up, send me a DM, send me a joke. Um, we'll be best friends. And then LinkedIn, Jocelyn Brady and jocelynbrady.com. Lovely. I'm going to put all of those links um, down below in the show notes so you can go and find out uh, more. Um, and is you, is, is you, I don't know what happened to my grammar. Um, is there anything coming up that you want to tell us about? Anything that you're excited about that you're doing that you want people to know? Well, I do have my signature program, one-on-one -on -one breakthrough your BS. It's like making breakthroughs in your business with your brain. Um, I'm also scheming some a workshop series with more details to come. On top of the one or uh, the panel workshop I'll be on on women and women and funny, the women on funny, funny women, something like that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, um, there's going to be a link to Jocelyn's signature program as well. Um, and I really hope that you'll let us know when the workshop, when both the workshops are out, the things that you've got in progress, because I will absolutely share those. Um, and then a little, yeah, a little bit later in the year, I hope you'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about identity, because I think that is a really important topic that I haven't really talked about in much detail before. Um, but for now, thank you. This has been as always, a total pleasure talking to you. Um, you are wise and funny, and um, thank you for bringing your wisdom and funniness to this podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now awake, so thank you. Yay! Well, if nothing else, we've accomplished that, so this is good. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jocelyn. This has been brilliant. Um, everybody else, uh, I will be back same time next week with Joe. So yeah, stay tuned for some updates. 
So that was an awesome interview. And I also need to wish Jocelyn a very happy birthday because it is her birthday today. If this is going, if you're listening to this on Friday, it's her birthday today. If you're listening to this on a Saturday, it was her birthday yesterday. Jocelyn, happy birthday. Thank you so much. I hope everyone really enjoyed that. Go and find out more about Jocelyn at jocelynbrady.com. Definitely subscribe to her YouTube channel and watch her tiny tips for your brain videos because they are hilarious and important. And yeah, and come back. We're, we're going to get Jocelyn back again later in the year. And we're going to talk about identity. Um, that's a, a huge and important topic. So we're going to talk about that. And yeah, in the meantime, go find out more about Jocelyn. And also remember that I have a masterclass coming up on Tuesday, which is this Tuesday at 5 p.m., all about tiny magical stories, tiny magical story masterclass. Um, Come along if you want to know how to turn a seemingly ordinary and maybe you think it's boring story into an incredible story that people that will captivate people and move them and make them want to find out more about you that's what this masterclass is going to be about so you can go to moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash masterclass and sign up for that and yeah i'll be back with joe next week if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast please go and rate us and review us five stars um if you didn't enjoy it other podcasts are available share it with your friends if you enjoyed this episode uh, not just for my sake but for jocelyn's sake as well share this with your friends and thank you thank you for listening we'll be back same time next week thanks for listening you can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Mm